for us, please, so that we have a record of all these lovely presentations. Um, for anyone who is presenting, who's just joined, if you have any concerns about us making the recording available online, please let us know. Just pop a uh, message into the chat to Tari and um, we'll make sure that gets handled for you. So I'm Sue Brennan, I'm from Cochrane, Australia and um, the Melbourne Growth Centre. I'm really delighted to be able to chair this session today um, on innovation and guideline development. I think innovation is a little bit of an overused word, but this really is an era in which we have seen true innovations. And we're very, very fortunate to have a number of speakers here with us today who have been right at the forefront of some of those innovations. So thank you very much for um, talking to us today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the custodians of the land on which I'm coming from, um, where I live and work. They're the Gunakurno people. So for those of you who don't know, I'm sitting in the western part of East Gippsland, really, if that makes sense. And um, it is Gunakurno land throughout this region. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to extend my acknowledgement of country to the traditional owners of the lands on which you're coming from. Um, so we have a couple of uh, longer presentations to begin with, and then the following ones are all seven minute presentations, so a little bit of a nice mix. Um, I'll ask you to use the chat and raise your hand if you have any questions. Very happy to hear other voices. So rather than make me read the questions, please do feel free to pop up your hand and um, share your voice with us. It's nice to know there's a bunch of other people out there and, and to hear from you too. Um, so um, our first speaker for the day is um, Saskia Chen, and we're very fortunate Saskia is presenting for us today with two different hats on, one on behalf of the Australian Living Evidence um, Consortium. So um, very keen to hear about that. And in the second presentation, she'll be presenting with a slightly different hat on. I'll let Saskia do the talking to that. So Saskia, would you like to share your slides with us? Okay, just appearing now, so that's all working perfectly, Saskia. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, so if everybody can see my slides, so um, I'll be presenting today on Living Guidelines Methods, an overview from the Australian Living Evidence Consortium, or ALEC. So firstly, I'm gonna go through what exactly is a living guideline? What are the ALEC Living Guidelines projects? And bringing together the experiences of ALEC to give an overview of the steps to developing a living guideline. And then looking at some of the key additional considerations for living guidelines, compared to traditional guidelines. So firstly, what exactly is a living guideline? Well, a living guideline is a clinical practice guideline that is continually updated, identifying new evidence as soon as it becomes available and appraising, synthesizing and incorporating it into living recommendations. They're ideal for high priority clinical areas where there is uncertainty and a likelihood of emerging new evidence. And they share similarities with partial updates for traditional guidelines but for living guidelines, there is a continual and explicit approach. So this is based off the experience of some of the frontier projects of ALEC. Um, and we have five frontier projects um, at the moment, which is on stroke, COVID-19, diabetes, inflammatory arthritis, and kidney impairment. We also recently had the Heart Foundation join, which is a newly joined suite of guidelines who are looking at moving towards a living approach. It's important to note that two of these guidelines were actually pre-existing guidelines that transitioned from a traditional approach to a living approach to guideline development, whereas three of these guidelines were developed from inception as living guidelines. So this is what we're calling the uh, spinning wheel of living. So these are the steps um, that you would take to develop a living guideline. And we pulled this together based on the experience across these different projects. 
So a lot of this uh, follows a similar approach to traditional guidelines. So I'm just going to be highlighting some of the key differences that you might want to think about if you're looking at developing a living guideline. So firstly, you want to think about whether a guideline is a priority for a living approach at all. So these are going back to that sort of same uh, living systematic review approach, living guidelines uh, follow the same three criteria that you might want to consider. So is it a high priority clinical area? Is there uncertainty or controversy? And is there a likelihood of new emerging evidence? And important to note is that it doesn't have to be for the whole guideline, but it could be recommendations within that guideline that you decide are appropriate for a living approach. So then you look at establishing your governance structure. And really one of the key differences here is that it needs a team culture that enables adaptive, dynamic and responsive work. And that there is uh, the changing conflicts of interest over time. So there's a bit of difference in your conflicts of interest management. There's also inbuilt structures uh, for member turnover needed. So unlike a traditional guideline that perhaps goes for two years um, and then it's finished, uh, this is an ongoing uh, process. So you need to account for the fact that some panel members and staff members will have turnover throughout the process. So then you go to define and revise your scope, which follows a similar process to traditional guidelines but there's the opportunity to actually revise your scope throughout the development process. So it's not as set in stone from the start as it would be for a traditional guideline. You then move on to prioritising your clinical questions. And the difference here is that you can prioritise your questions for varying intensities of living mode. So you may have some that are high priority that you might search for you know, more frequently and update more frequently, and some that are lower priority where you perhaps expect evidence to emerge, but perhaps more slowly over time. So you might monitor them every three months or something. You then have the opportunity to revise your prioritizations throughout the process. So as Julian mentioned this morning, we've recently done that for the COVID-19 guidelines, um, where we've kind of, um, decided over time, you know, that there are certain recommendations um, that have a lot of emerging evidence coming through. So some of the drug treatment recommendations for COVID, and we put them as higher priority, where there are some recommendations that have tended to remain much more static over time, and that we might not be expecting any new emerging evidence to come out for those. So we put them as lower priority. There's also the opportunity to add new questions um, and we have a place on our website, for example, for the COVID guidelines where clinicians can go in and suggest um, new questions. So then we look at identifying new evidence. So new evidence um, can be searched for, we're saying at least every three months in order for a recommendation to remain living, but sometimes it can be like for some of our COVID questions as searched for on a daily basis. Um, we also have worked quite closely across ALEC with both Covidence and Magic App, which have features um, inbuilt now to actually enable uh, living guidelines. So you then look at incorporating new evidence. Um, so whether that be systematic reviews, RCTs or observational studies, if it's expected to change the direction or strength of the recommendations and according to decision thresholds um, that you have made. And importantly, um, you can actually revise your inclusion criteria uh, throughout the process, um, which again is quite different to your traditional guideline. So for example, with uh, COVID, we had you know, no evidence um, really at the start. So we were kind of looking at whatever evidence we could find. We included observational studies for some questions, which later that we then shifted to smaller RCTs when they became available. And then as we got larger, more robust RCT evidence, um, we could shift our inclusion criteria to primarily include some of those you can then develop and update your recommendations. Uh, so it's important to note here that the unit of update, again, is the individual recommendation and you don't need to wait for the whole guideline um, to be revised. You then seek approval and endorsement, which can occur at multiple time points um, and needs to be coordinated with external approval processes and timelines. So here um, we have the NHMRC guideline approval processes. Um, however, we might actually publish interim or draft updates um, prior to gaining approval for the updates. So it's just about making that clear within your guideline um, what has the formal approval and which is still pending approval for updates. And then you have your publication and dissemination, which again also occurs at new time points for new or updated individual recommendations. 
Um, and it's really about uh, the balance um, of how you communicate that um, information, whether that's for major updates only, or you communicate also for more minor updates. Um, and primarily we've been using um, a newsletter that we send um, via email out to our stakeholders that anyone can sign up for. So then uh, you might look at transitioning out of living mode. So if something is no longer a priority, um, it, there's may perhaps no longer any uncertainty or clinical controversy, or no new evidence is anticipated, then you may decide uh, that that recommendation is no longer appropriate for living. So then you might go back around um, the wheel again, and you may perhaps uh, go through all of the stages if you need to redefine your scope or reprioritize your clinical questions. Or you may just have the questions that you currently have and you may just continue identifying new evidence and incorporating new evidence and updating them. So the summary from this is really that living guidelines can address some of the pitfalls of traditional guideline development. And we hope that this has provided a sort of overarching guide for guideline developers um, using examples of what we had as quite different uh, guideline experiences across ALEC and also some similarities um, to provide this sort of overarching um, approach. We are limited by the relatively short time period um, that ALEC has been developing living guidelines. So we've only been developing them from 2018 onwards with some obviously the COVID guideline only being the last year or so. We um, really need further in-depth guidance um, on living evidence methods, and that is currently being developed by the ALEC Methods and Processes Working Group. And we're looking at the moment to developing um, a handbook on how to develop living guidelines. So thank you very much, and any questions? Thank you, Saskia, for um, a very clear and beautifully um, um, presented um, session, not really lovely visuals in your slides there, and um, we're all going to come to you for colour coding of our, our figures from now on. Are there any questions for Saskia? You can either raise your hand or put something in the chat. I do have a burning question and, and I really love some of the language you used in that presentation, Saskia, talking about, you know, the, the team culture and um, particularly the varying intensities of living mode, because I don't think we could ever have imagined such a high intensity living mode as has been the case that um, yourself and many of your colleagues on this particular session have lived through. Have you got any tips and tricks for surviving such an intensive period of time? And I guess in particular for making sure the team feels fresh because it's really hard when you're facing up in continual cycles of this process to to kind of keep that alive yeah i mean i think we've actually had quite good motivation level i guess everybody um being part, you know, wanting to contribute towards COVID and wanting to help out um, really kept people engaged throughout the process and we also had just a really large amount of people involved. So we had a lot of volunteers, we had over 250 clinical experts um, who were helping us with the process and were providing that input. They're all volunteering their time. Um, so I think just that really, you know, everybody coming together, um, that really um, helped motivate the process uh, for COVID. Um, but we have seen in some of the other guidelines as well that that um, motivation has, has been maintained, um, but I guess yet to see um, whether the same levels would be maintained for something outside of COVID, but hopefully not necessary to have that maintained at that level of intensity again. So, yeah. Yeah, I think certainly sitting on the outside, it's very impressive seeing the way um, you've maintained that kind of team culture to really keep things moving along. Are there any questions, other questions for Saskia before we move? to the next presenter. You'll have time to ask, ask you more questions, but on a slightly different topic shortly. No? It's always one of the things about Zoom. At the end of the day, we all start to get a little bit fatigued, so that's not for want of interesting presentations. Thank you very much, Saskia, and the incredible team behind that work. It really is very impressive. Emma, can I ask you to share your slides, please? So our next presenter is Emma Tavender. Emma's also giving a 10-minute presentation, five minutes for questions. Um, if we have time at the end, if we're ahead of time, then we will allow a bit, bit more time for any other questions that might emerge. But um, I'll hand over to Emma. Uh, 
Hi hey everyone, is that okay? I've got two screens, you never know if you've got a presenter or No, it's perfect. Emma. All right, okay, great. Okay, so I'm Emma Tavender. I'm the Knowledge Translation Coordinator for PREDICT, and I'm here to talk about developing the PREDICT Australian and New Zealand guideline for mild to moderate head injuries in children. And this is balancing rigor and feasibility. Okay, just to give you a bit of a background about PREDICT. So PREDICT is the Pediatric Research and Emergency Department's International Collaborative. We have received two NHMRC Centres for Research Excellence, and we have over 50 ED sites around Australia and New Zealand, and 36 of them are active in research at the moment. This gives us access to about 600,000 patients, and we've had about 100 um, network publications so far. So a main focus of our research over the last 10 years has been to improve the care of children with head injuries. We've looked at determining the optimal head injury clinical decision rule for the region. We've looked at high risk patients, those with bleeding disorders. We've looked at prevalence of traumatic brain injuries in children who delay their presentations to emergency, and also those who present with head injuries on their vomiting. So in 2018, we decided to develop the first Australian and New Zealand guideline for mild to moderate head injuries. And we wanted to incorporate our primary evidence and also to contextualize some of the international research. So the scope of the guideline and some of the clinical questions that we wanted to include were informed with a qualitative study with uh, 43 um, clinicians that interviewed from 19 hospitals from a wide range of hospitals ranging from tertiary pediatric through to regional and rural hospitals. And we wanted to understand their needs, and that was information needs, what scenarios they found particularly challenging, how they wanted their information um, provided to them. And this was going to inform, uh, obviously, the scope of the guideline. And some of the questions we had were, how do I manage a child with ventricular shunt? Those with bleeding disorders, should they undergo a cranial CT or a period of observation? For those children who are diagnosed with repeat concussion, what distinct discharge information should be provided? And this information was presented at the first guideline working group and it resulted in 33 questions, two in triage, 17 imaging and 14 discharge questions. And we were aware that there were several international head injury guidelines out there and we really wanted to find a high quality one that was up to date that we could actually contextualize for the Australian setting. However, when we searched for the guidelines, we found seven in total, which came down to four when we um, assessed them using the agreed two. We, um, we realized that actually there wasn't one guideline that covered all the questions we wanted answering. I mean, it became clear that we'd have to use different recommendations for different questions. We had hoped to use the graded document approach where you adopt, adapt and create de novo recommendations. And we obviously wanted to use evidence decision frameworks that guide you through a structured process to um, develop your clinical recommendations. However, the process is based on updating existing grade tables and the guidelines we found were variable. Some didn't have grade tables, some didn't have um, information or had insufficient information to actually do the grade tables. And we didn't really have the, we didn't have the time or the resources to develop grade tables for all four guidelines. So we decided to follow an adapted approach, which is taking steps from the adapt, which is the old um, method of the adaptions, and the grade document. So I'll take you through briefly the methods we used, and then I've got also a reflection slide as well, which is our reflections of the process of the last two years. So the first step was to map the recommendations of the four guidelines to the 33 clinical questions and then extract the source evidence. In instances where you had recommendations from different guidelines, we had to choose the most relevant. And that was based on the appropriateness to the question, where they answered the question we wanted. The currency of the literature, which had the most up-to-date search date, access to evidence tables, and whether it was developed in a context that was relevant to Australasia. We updated the literature search, which is searching the medical and nursing literature to find out what new evidence was out there. And the date of the search was the, the date of the last search of the oldest guideline. So the oldest guideline had a search date of about February uh, 2015. And so therefore we searched from January 2015 forward. 
We then wanted to select the key evidence. So unlike the graded document approach where you're synthesizing all the information and you're updating grade tables, we wanted to look at the new evidence in light of the source recommendation and the evidence behind those source recommendations. And the key evidence was dependent on the strength of the recommendation. So if it was a strong recommendation, which was supported by high quality evidence, then the key evidence, the new evidence, had to inform the question, address the primary outcome and be high quality. However, if the recommendation was supported by weak evidence, or there was uncertainty, or there was, they did not address the primary outcome, the guideline working group could rely solely on the new evidence to develop the recommendation. And so we could develop recommendations that were adopted, which was this no change to source recommendation, the evidence base or implementation. It could be adapted, so there was a change to um, the source recommendation wording based on new evidence or contextual information. Or there could be new recommendations where there either wasn't a source recommendation or the recommendation didn't have evidence and we developed consensus recommendations. So the guideline working group went through the considerations very similar to the um, graded document approach where we looked at the strength and quality of the evidence, the balances of the benefits and harms, the values and preferences of the target group, resource use, cost of feasibility and acceptability. So this is a bit of a cluttered slide, but this is the form from the um, main guideline. And this was a structured process that the guideline working group went through to answer these questions as they considered each question. So the first one is the predict question about use of ultrasound and the source guideline, source recommendations below it, this is from the Italian guideline. And then we have a discussion about the generalizability of that recommendation to the target population and its applicability to the Australasian healthcare setting. We then assessed the new evidence in um, summary format and made a decision whether it was adopted, adapted or created new guidance. And then if it was evidence informed, consensus based or a practice point. We had a guideline recommendation and then we had a rationale and the rationale included a statement on the source evidence. So what evidence was behind the source recommendation and then a new evidence um, section, which was really a discussion of the key evidence we found. And then we have a feasibility section at the bottom. Was this recommendation would be resulting in a change in practice, resource implications, and were there any barriers to implementation? So after a 12-week consultation period, the PREDICT guideline was released on our um, PREDICT website in February of this year. And it was also published in an EMA journal as well. And we had a summary document, a large document, and then we had an algorithm and some training materials um, as part of that guideline. So we were reflecting on this about the guideline and firstly, the scope was much larger and wider than we first envisaged. I think that's the same for everybody who does a guideline, but we'd sort of started out quite naively thinking that the scope would be around imaging decision making. And actually, once we had the qualitative information, it became clear that the scope needed to be larger for the Australasian setting with some of the referral patterns and some of the um, patient groups. We'd started down the adaption pathway because we thought that it might be quicker and easier but with a, a guideline this large with four different types of guidelines and also that the methods were very variable it actually still took us two years and um, implementation should be part of the guideline process we undertook audits right at the beginning to look at variability of practice um, throughout the uh, different sites the qualitative gave us information on how they wanted their information delivered what they wanted to um, receive as an information. And then we made sure that implementation was considered at each of the recommendation development stages. And this has now moved forward into we've got a, an, an impact and implementation plan after the guideline about how we're going to measure each of these um, recommendations. And secondly, it's really all about the team. Um, of course, we had all the main clinician groups um, involved, but it was also about making sure that they kept involved for the whole two years and we were very lucky that happened and they were a great team and so this is the team thank you very much they, if they're on but also Agnes Wilson and Jenny Wynn they're actually um, a guideline consultancy with PIRCO they were fantastic in helping us get through a huge amount of work and this is the reference for um, the paper that we wrote on this particular case thank you Thanks so much, Emma. If you do have questions for Emma, please do raise your hand, pop them in the chat. I think it's um, 
both reassuring when you've been through the process yourself, but also a bit daunting to hear that the process of adapting a guideline proves to be so difficult. It feels very similar to the situation with using any existing systematic review in that we never quite get the perfect match either in terms of the questions addressed or the methodology we want to see. Um, while I'm waiting to see if anyone else has got any questions, Emma, I, I was interested in just maybe hearing a little bit more. If I if I heard you correctly, I think you said that um, where you had a weak or conditional recommendation from an existing guideline that the panel um, could just rely on the new evidence you had. Um, I wonder if you might elaborate on that just a little bit about the rationale behind that decision. Can other people hear me? I can see Cindy moving. I, I can hear you, Sue. I think oh, Emma might have frozen. I think Emma might have frozen. Okay, thank you, Tari. I thought that might be the case given I could see the only other person on video. Um, okay. Emma, I'm not sure whether you're there. Tari's put a question in the chat to you and we can come back to some questions for you. We might, um, while we're sorting out whatever tech situation is, um, hitting you right at the moment. We might go on to the next presenter and come back to questions at the end because we're on, on time. We've got play, heaps of time at the moment. So Saskia, are you happy to go ahead and pop your slides up for your next presentation, round two of Saskia's insights into guideline innovation? And I'm really looking forward to this one. Thanks, Saskia. Thank you. This is the shortest presentation that Sarsi is giving. It's a seven minute one, so a little bit faster than the last one. Over to you, Sarsi. Thank you. Yeah, so today, um, this presentation is going to be on methods and processes for updating guidelines, barriers and enablers. So firstly, I'll go through uh, the methods uh, that we use to undertake this project. Um, and then I'll go through the results and the things that we identified and then the summary and next steps. Okay, so the methods um, that we use, we used um, a 2011 survey by the Guidelines International Network Updating Guidelines Working Group. And we sent this survey, um, we sent this as an initial basis, and then we built upon this survey to include more questions and follow on focus groups. So we sent the survey to all GIN members and organisations involved in updating guidelines. Um, and we had 40 participants uh, for the survey. We then conducted a series of focus groups uh, for which we had 13 participants and then conducted a quantitative and qualitative thematic analysis of the results. So the first thing we identified was on updating processes and we found that the decisions to update tended to be more ad hoc rather than explicit processes and they were heavily dependent on funding and resource availability and there was a need to prioritise topics. The proposed solutions for the limited resources were inclusion of systematic reviews by others and using guidelines from other organisations. And willingness for this um, increased from the 2011 survey to the 2021 survey. So for how the decision to update was made, um, it was primarily made by a combination of literature and experts um, and sometimes was made by an external body such as commissioners. For the types of evidence used to inform the update, uh, it tended to be a combination of all three of primary studies, systematic reviews and guidelines by others, with um, most not using just a singular source um, to inform the update. So we then also asked about COVID-19 and whether it had prompted organisations to change their updating processes and found that 40% had made changes to their updating. And this was uh, not surprisingly, um, for virtual meeting and file sharing, uh, but followed by rapid systematic review methods and adopting recommendations from other guidelines. So we then looked at our next theme, which was living guidelines. And we found that over half um, of participants um, had either used living guideline methods or were considering using these methods in future. 
But for the focus groups, we actually found um, that most participants did not have direct or had very limited experience in producing living guidelines. So the greatest perceived barriers to transitioning to using a living guidelines approach was again, funding and resources, uh, and particularly access to ongoing funding for where funding tended to be given in block periods, um, such as what we tend to have in Australia. Um, we also found that keeping up with the ongoing workload was cited as being difficult as there's often large amounts of evidence to filter through on a regular basis. We did find that collaboration was proposed as a potential solution to the resource issues, yet there were several examples given of unsuccessful collaborations, but this was mainly due to differences in organisational structures, timelines and approval processes um, between the different organisations. Uh, we then looked at the search frequency for those who were using a living approach and found that this varied quite a lot from weekly to every 12 months. The criteria that was used to justify making a guideline living was going back to that three criteria primarily of emerging evidence, priority and uncertainty, um, or a combination of those or other factors. We then uh, looked at what methods were used for updating recommendations, and we found that mostly there was an assessment of the quality of the evidence and a subset of the guideline panel was consulted but also developers may consult the entire guideline panel or they, and they may or may not complete an evidence to decision profile. So for our next theme, we looked at IT and we found that the most uh, commonly used programs for screening and data extraction were Covidence and Epi Reviewer. And the most uh, commonly used program for grade assessments and publication was MAGIC. Um, we found that IT can enable harmonization and the ability to share evidence summaries between developers However, most of the focus group participants were not actually using any supportive technologies. And they really cited that the cost and training required were major barriers to their use, particularly for some smaller organisations. There was also the requirements for a specific format for the guideline. Um, so when updating methods produced in an old format and then subsequently having to update that in something like magic. There was also limited functionality for other review types and methods. So we had some people from HTA organisations there, for example, um, who said that they were conducting mainly not intervention questions, but primarily focusing on diagnostic and prognostic questions. And that limited the perceived usefulness of any um, adopting any of the currently available technologies. So for our last theme, we looked at alerting users to updates of the guideline, um, and we found that uh, balancing the level of detail of what to communicate was tricky, and that the primary method of communicating um, was usually via um, a newsletter to stakeholders. However, there were a large number of other uh, methods that were used, such as annual conference spots um, or pre-existing networks. So for the summary and next steps, we really found that Funding and resources were the biggest barrier to guideline updating and adopting of living methods. Um, but as Julian highlighted as well earlier this morning, um, the living approach is not necessarily more resource intensive um, than the traditional updating approach. So this was an issue across both updating and living guidelines. Um, if we could further harness the advances in IT to make programs better fit for purpose and reduce some of the cost barriers, that could be quite beneficial. Um, and also enabling greater collaboration between guideline developers to share materials and reduce the deduplication of efforts. So um, while some people had reported some bad experiences um, with collaboration, people still really felt the strong desire to collaborate. Um, and also just getting clearer guidance for updating and living methods, particularly on how to decide um, what to prioritise. Um, so what questions should be prioritised, but also what questions should not be prioritised. And that is also something that we are looking at um, within ALEC at the moment to develop further guidance, at least for the living approach in these areas. So, thank you, and any questions? Thank you, Saskia. I don't think I've been on a session where we have such beautifully timed presentations. So well done to all our speakers so far. Of course, Emma has given us a little bit of a short term gain. We've come back to Emma for questions at the end of the session because I think we will have time to ask some more global questions and there's at least one in the chat for Emma. Has anyone got any questions for Saskia? I'm sure some of you will have been in this space of moving towards a living guideline model, perhaps thinking about adopting new technologies and um, tackling the slightly daunting 
task of transitioning across to a new mode of producing guidelines? No, I'm going to put you on the spot, Saskia, and I, I know this is a bit of an unfair question because in some ways you're presenting on behalf of a group at GIN who's, who's been doing all this groundwork. But I mean, the, the question of collaboration, it really strikes me as so, so critical on many levels. I was thinking about that in relation to Emma's experience in relation to other groups internationally producing um, similar guidelines. And um, are there any kind of practical things that, I mean, GIN obviously is a network designed to try to build this collaboration. Are there any kind of practical things we could be doing better to facilitate that? Yeah, so this was actually something that was talked about at the recent guideline um, international network conference. There was the updating guidelines working group. So they were thinking of actually developing perhaps maybe a bit more of a, a group or some sort of, you know, it was talked about of maybe a platform where people can go to and have like online discussions um, of, with different guideline developers. But also, I think, not limited to GIN, because that was something that came out of the focus groups, at least, because we went out to broader organisations than just GIN, which, again, had a bit of a cost barrier because you have to pay as a member to be part of GIN. So really having some platform that's freely available where people can just, you know, get together and communicate um, and kind of using some of those platforms like Magic and things um, where you can really share the data a little bit more easily. Um, but again, having that cost barrier of who has access to magic um, is another factor. So there's a few things that can, can be done, I think. Um, but yeah, it just we need to enable those collaborations to happen more frequently for sure. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing. And I think from my own perspective, I feel like I learn an awful lot by shadowing other people. And sometimes that experience can help guideline panels, um, I guess, leverage some funding and other resources they might need. So there are a lot there's a lot we can do. There's a couple of other questions for you, Saskia, in the chat. So Melissa Morano has asked, how amenable do you think funding models for guideline updating living guidelines are to change? Yeah, so I think this really depended on um, how fixed sort of the funding structures were in the organisations or the countries um, that were involved in this um, particular. So there were some experiences where um, people, for example, at NICE in the UK, you know, they're funded as an organisation. So the transition to that funding approach for living is not that different than to what they would have for their traditional guidelines approach. Um, but in places like Australia, where we do have a bit more that block funding sort of by project, um, it is a bit more of a, a shift in sort of thinking um, towards the way that we might fund things. Um, Jane, Jane, I'm not sure your last name. I can only see your first name. Um, uh, Jane's asked if Saskia can expand on the priorities to balance the level of details to communicate. Yeah, so this was really about, you know, what is quite a minor update perhaps that you maybe think, well, we can make those changes and perhaps not make, um, it's not as important to make people aware of those or whether, you know, you're kind of bombarding them with information then very frequently um, and they might prefer just sort of, you know, only when major updates are made. But I think that that's where having multiple different ways that you can communicate so maybe all the minor updates you still put out on social media so people that are following on social media can still see that but perhaps when you have your newsletter you have much more than just the, the major updates um, so there's a few different approaches that can be taken but that was definitely a challenge that people were finding um, particularly for the living approach when you are making changes on such a regular basis. Um, thanks, Saskia. There is one more question in the chat for you. I might, we're just about to hit the time for our next presentation, so we might just move to that. Um, I might ask you to respond in the chat if you could to that question, but if we've got time, we'll um, open it up for you to, to um, give us perhaps a response in person, guidelines, <laughs> achieving better balance on um, panels. And I, um, if you're right, I'm happy to hand over to you now. Thanks so much. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. Um, so my name's Anna. I'm an honours student at the Burnett Institute with Monash University. Um, and today I'll be presenting an analysis of the gender of members of National Clinical Practice Guideline Development Groups since 2015. So globally around 75% of the healthcare workforce are women. Um, however, roles within the workforce are not equally distributed with women predominantly occupying lower paid or lower status roles. 
Um, so for example, in Australia, despite decades of gender parity in medical school graduates, in 2015, only 22% of chief medical or health officers and 28% of medical school deans were women. And while these numbers have improved slightly to the present day, they're still well below um, representative of the wider medical workforce um, and of the population. So we often talk about the causes of these inequalities, but I want us to also consider today the consequences of this. So the, a lack of diversity in healthcare leadership has the potential to lead to loss of ingenuity and creativity, as well as uh, making it less likely that the diversity of patient populations will be considered. Guidelines are a particularly clear example of how this can happen because their recommendations, which are developed based on evidence, but by the leadership group, uh, directly impact patient care. And in this way, inequity in healthcare leadership has the potential to tr translate into health inequality for patients. So um, we aim to assess the gender composition of Australian clinical practice guideline panels in Australia. Um, the whole project will look uh, over, over 10 years, so before since 2010, but today I'll be presenting our preliminary findings so far um, from 2015 to the present. Um, and while there's some existing evidence from overseas, this is the first study to look at this specifically in Australia. And we also wanted to look at other factors related to guideline development to see if that had an impact um, on the proportion of women involved. So in terms of methodology, um, we used the systematic review approach. Um, so we started with a search. Uh, we used the National Health and Medical Research um, guideline portal, as well as guideline specific databases and a broader search as well. And then we screened um, all the results using covenants with two independent reviewers and then extracted data about each guideline in general um, and then each individual on the guideline as well, which was all then de-identified and analysed in state of 16. Um, just a note on gender that we were trying to um, determine, I suppose, the uh, an individual's social identity, so the gender rather than their biological sex. And we did this either through direct reporting in the guideline, um, through gendered titles used, or through pronouns used in their professional biographies. So for our preliminary results, on the left here, this flowchart just demonstrates um, our screening results. Um, so the total review will include 430 high quality guidelines, but today the results I'm presenting are out of 142. So there were just under 4,000 individuals involved in total. Um, slightly more of them were men than women. Um, and one individual here is marked as other because they use they them pronouns in their professional biography, um, but didn't specify their gender. And of note here, only one out of the 142 guidelines actually reported gender of its development group members. So all the others were determined based on those proxy measures I mentioned earlier. Looking at the distribution of women on each guideline, almost half of all guidelines uh, actually had less than 40% women on them. And this framework, less than 40% over 60%, um, is based uh, on a similar framework that's been used in previous studies of gender and guideline, which kind of reflects the difficulty in defining exactly what equity looks like in terms of percentages, but it also reflects um, targets for um, committee membership from the Australian Medical Association and also for SAGE, the Science in Australia Gender Equity Group. Um, so looking at some of the other factors related to guideline development, um, there was a significant association um, between proportion of women and NHMRC approval. So um, NHMRC, guidelines with NHMRC approval were more likely to have more women on them. Um, and there were a smaller proportion that had very few women on them. Similarly, for source of funding, there was a significant relationship where National Health and Medical Research Council and national government funded guidelines had um, more kind of equitable distribution. Interestingly, um, 51 out of the 142 guidelines uh, didn't state anything about their funding within the guideline document or wasn't freely available. Um, and this group had a particularly high proportion of guidelines with um, few women on them, suggesting a potential association between transparency of the guideline development process and reporting and um, gender distribution. There was not a statistically significant association with grade methodology, but it is worth noting that the sample size is smaller than um, the final intended sample size. And we also didn't do multivariate analyses, which would obviously be useful um, in the future to kind of strengthen the results. 
We also divided up the guidelines by subject area. Here I've just shown the most populated subject areas, which also reflect some of the highest uh, burden of disease in Australia, which makes sense. Um, and these were cancer guidelines and cardiovascular vascular disease guidelines. Um, and for both these particular subject areas, there were many more men than women, particularly looking at cardiovascular disease guidelines. And this kind of reflects um, the broader number of um, sort of the, the division of that, the workforce in these specialty areas as well. So in conclusion, it appears that uh, Australian clinical practice guideline panels were not gender balanced during this time period, reflecting some of the broader issues in terms of uh, equality in the healthcare workforce and particularly in leadership. We'll continue this research and hopefully strengthen um, our results and be able to look at a trend over time as well to see if anything's changed. Um, but from these preliminary results, it appears that reporting of gender in guidelines is poorly done and would be very helpful in order to continually audit and um, manage this potential inequality. And I'd like to acknowledge um, my supervisors and um, the other people involved in this project as well. Thanks so much, and a very important um, piece of work to make sure we do better on this um, particular aspect of the way we recruit panels. Um, any questions for Anna? Yeah, Melissa? Hi, Anna, thanks so much for that. Um, I, I may have missed it, Anna, I'm sorry if I did. Did you find any association between uh, the gender of the panel chair and, and the composition of the panel? Mm. So we did also look at um, roles um, specifically. I haven't included in these results here, um, but we did look at chairs. Um, it seemed that there wasn't, um, I, I suppose we hypothesized that there would be a more significant um, imbalance in chairs, but it actually seemed that it was not that different to um, the guideline development group in general. Um, there were some interesting gendered trends in the um, sort of dividing up the guideline membership by their roles, particularly um, of interest was that um, sort of technical roles like project development, um, systematic reviewers were really heavily um, favoured by women. Um, so there was a really strong trend towards women in those kind of, um, those roles um, compared to the rest. Thanks for that. And, and I do have one more question if, if no one else does. Yeah, I think you can, we've got one minute to go, Melissa. Yeah, and it's kind of probably sort of tangential to your research, but I'm just wondering if this issue around representation and composition versus participation, and if that's something that could be explored or is being explored. Yeah, certainly it's not something we've looked at, but it's um, definitely a, a very important question. I suppose um, some of the issues um, that we've faced methodologically are sort of around reporting and how, how do you measure these um, slightly less tangible things. And I guess that would be um, a barrier, but obviously an, an incredibly important um, question to answer, yeah. Mm, thanks, Anna. There was some, I'm old enough to remember the coordinated care trials where there was some very nice work done on this on how the um, panels interacted and, and how voices of different groups were heard on those panels or more correctly were not heard on those panels. So there is some history of that kind of research being done and it's very, very valuable, I think. Okay, on that note, we're right on the 3.30 mark. Thank you so much to all our speakers for sticking to time, but more importantly, for such a um, really inspiring and um, important array of work that you've been doing. Um, thank you to my co-chair, Tara Turner, who's been keeping things moving very smoothly in the background. And thank you all for attending today. Um, we look forward to you joining us again tomorrow and um, have a very good evening. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue.